Welcome back. It's time now for The World This Week. The World This Week in partnership with The Daily Beast from London. Nico Hines, world editor of The Daily Beast. How are you, sir? I'm very well. Good evening. Good evening as well to Borzo Dargai, international correspondent for The Independent. How are things? Great. Great! Absolutely. All right. Ukrainian journalist uh, Vladislav Davidson, the author of From Odessa with Love, is with us as well. Are things great with you? Not as great. I Not think. as great. OK, well, maybe we'll get to that in a moment. Yeah. Uh, she puts the two in the morning in France 24. Seoul correspondent Yena Lee is uh, with us. How are you feeling? Should I say good evening? Good evening. It's a bit chilly here. OK, the world this week where you can always join the conversation you have on Facebook and Twitter. Hashtag world this week. Now, all here uh, present pedal in the bad news business. So it's always nice to see someone get the call. I'm calling you on behalf of the Norwegian Nobel Committee uh, to inform you that in a very few minutes it will be announced here from the Nobel Institute that the Center for Civil Liberties will be awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for 2022 together with another human rights organization and one individual. So congratulations Whoa. to you. Oh, it's uh, okay. It's it's uh, uh, <laughs> it's great. <laughs> Thank you. Ukraine Center for Civil Liberties, one of three recipients for that prize alongside Memorial, the group founded in 1987 when it was still the Soviet Union. Last year was forced to go uh, underground, if you will, by the Kremlin. And the jailed Belarus human rights activist Alice Bielyatsky, the 60-year-old head of the uh, Human Rights Center Vyazna, uh, seen here when he was jailed between 2011 and 2014. Right now he's back behind bars, this time on a tax evasion charge. Here's how he reacted back in 2020 when he was awarded the EU's Sakharov Human Rights Prize. This award represents strong moral support for those people who were repressed, but who didn't give up. They continued to fight. Uh, Nico Hines, he, uh, his wife says she doesn't know whether he's been informed that he's a winner. Yeah, well, I guess at some point he's going to get the news. And although it's easy to say that these things are meaningless, I think it is really important for kind of global solidarity to be expressed by these individuals who are putting themselves through the most harrowing experiences. And of course, the award can't go to everybody, but I do think that it does send a message of, of unity. And I think the Nobel Prize in particular obviously has a real global cachet. And let's not forget that every year some sycophantic cretin uh, nominates Vladimir Putin for the Nobel Peace Prize, which no doubt suggests that he wants to win it himself. And I think it's important that such a kind of revered institution stands up against Putin again. I mean, that's obviously what this is, right? We've got three um, human rights organizations, all basically who are aligned against Putin's war in Ukraine. And so this is sending a message which repeats the message from last year, where the Nobel Prize went to um, Dmitry Muratov, um, the editor uh, at Novaya Gazeta, who has fought against Putin for so long. Um, and I think it's really, really important that that message gets through. And I've no doubt that Putin will be somewhere in a bunker shouting at his subordinates, furious that this has happened again. So, uh, Vladislav Davidson, the French got the Nobel Literature Prize. Yes. You get the Nobel, as, as Nika was saying, you get the Nobel Peace Prize second year running. Yes, uh, it's, it's a great thing. Uh, obviously, all three of these organizations are very noble. Uh, Memorial, of course, uh, has, has been doing extraordinary work for three decades. There is some concern on the Ukrainian side that there should have been a cleavage between the Russians and the Belarusians, or the, the, the Belarus organizations, and the Ukrainians who are uh, on, on different sides in, in terms of uh, democracy and dictatorship. No one on the Ukrainian side begrudges the prizes to, to Belarus and Russian activists. But there are lots of people who think that this is a kind of colonialist, uh, kind of impolite thing to do. You should have you should have given one to either Ukraine. But who can who in Ukraine yeah. can object to Memorial, the 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 organization of the slain journalist uh, Anna Politovskaya, 
which has been doing such great work over sure. the decades. Uh, yeah, by the way, t today is today is uh, the anniversary of her death, and it's also Putin's birthday. So uh, it's important to remember that all these things are, of course, connected. Everyone knows that the Ukrainian struggle is uh, the struggle of the Belarus people and obviously the, the Russian democratic movement struggle also. But there are people, and I'm not saying I'm one of them, but I, I think it's important that someone delivers a viewpoint widely held in Ukrainian civil society who are not happy with uh, this kind of conjunction of organizations. There are people in, in amongst my friends who are not who are not thrilled of this. Borzo Dargai? Well, I, I mean, I, I think that, you know, the, the Nobel Prize is, it, it, you, you mentioned the word kind of colonialist, but it is a sort of uh, certain Western European view of the world in general, and uh, a Western view, Western European view of human rights and, and so on. And I think that what it underscores, and I'm not going to address the, 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 the cleavage that I heard about, that the Ukrainians resent being lumped in with Belarus and, and Russia when they're at war with those countries. Um, I, I'm not going to get into that, but what is really interesting is just how important and how much focus there is on the post-Soviet space these days, and how these and, and you and I are old enough where we remember when you know the the, the Soviet Union collapsed and and um, the world changed, and back then even there were these sort of dark, ominous things that were happening, these developments, and I remember reading and hearing people saying, "Oh, if you don't deal with this." This is going to happen. Oh, if you don't deal with this issue, this particular brand of nationalism, this will happen. And it all happened. All those dire warnings that, you know, all these unresolved festering issues about the, the, the post-Soviet space have come back to haunt the world. Come back to haunt the world. Uh, Yena Lee, uh, is that the feeling where you are that the, the Nobel Peace Prize is something very European, very Western? It is to some extent, but at the same time, it is such an important international event. It, it does, like, attract a lot of attention. Uh, the Nobel Prize for Literature as well, especially. I mean, those books are going to get translated immediately and sold all over. And the same for the Peace Prize. The South Korean president won as well a few decades ago. So people do care and they are interested in it. I'd, I'd like to add also that I think that you know, it's clearly a political message against the Kremlin and also against the Lukashenko. But it's also interesting that they picked uh, three civil society groups and the founder of a civil society group. I think it's also a win for civil society today because, you know, it's not for once been given to a, a sitting president and it hasn't been given to a massive uh, organization such as a, an offshoot of the UN. It's been given to these uh, human rights groups. All right. And you heard there a moment ago Vladislav Davidson. Uh, uh, mentioning that uh, there's a birthday in Moscow uh, this Friday, uh, the Orthodox Patriarch Kirill leading tributes for Vladimir Putin to deliver him from, quote, all resistance of visible and invisible enemies. Russia will need more than prayers, though, to stop the steady counteroffensive of Ukrainian forces, uh, which continues to press on uh, from the northeast all the way down to the southern Kherson region, where France 24's team spoke with locals who say they've been all too happy to help. We formed a patrol group with 26 men in it. They climbed to the top of the buildings with binoculars and kept watch. They watched the enemy's movements and reported them to the army, which then bombed them. As there wasn't much intelligence at the start, we helped the army a lot then. We gave them the positions of all the convoys. That said, very recently, some guys who were still active called me. They told me they'd spotted an important position, and I immediately called the military to pass on the information. That woman's uh, fearless. Uh, sure. Vladislav Davidson, your reaction? Uh, you know, they're millions of fearless people just like her in, in Ukraine fighting the Russian invasion. I, we, we've all seen tremendous things, tremendous acts. Now, front so, lines move. Yeah. They yes. go back and forth. And she's speaking uh, to us. I mean, they could go the other way at some point, right? Probably not, based on how the Russian army is fighting, but it's entirely possible. She is taking a risk long term, exposing her identity and what, what she's done heroically to help the Ukrainian uh, the Ukrainian army, obviously, uh, co collaborators are shot. Uh, the, the Russians, if they had found her and her, her 
26 friends, they would have killed them all without a trial. They would have just dumped their bodies in, uh, in ditches of a sort that the Ukrainian army is finding everywhere where it retakes territory. So, yeah, she's a, she's a hero, obviously. Uh, Nico Hines, uh, it's been a week of just everyday announcements of gains by the Ukrainians. We can show perhaps a, a, a map of, a, of the front line. But are we getting a little ahead of ourselves? Russia this Friday announcing that it had clawed back some grounds around the uh, Donetsk uh, town of Bakhmut. Uh, winter is coming. Those people who've been mobilized, perhaps they won't be, they're not uh, uh, fully trained the way the, or as motivated as the Ukrainians are, but the numbers are there and uh, it's not over. It's definitely not over. I've heard quite a few analysts saying there's only one way this war is going to go now, that there's only one winner. Um, it's obvious that the momentum is with the Ukraine at the moment, and they're making fantastic gains, and it's absolutely incredible to see. And I understand why people are, are kind of getting carried away. But at the same time, although the mobilization in Russia has been a mess, although there are endless, countless stories of um, problems and the wrong kind of people turning up, no equipment. Uh, you know, it's just an absolute catalogue of errors. But at the end of the day, there's a huge number of people being called up. And if they can all kind of get themselves to the, to the battlefront and eventually um, sufficient equipment arrives to support them, there is a definite possibility that there could be a strong push back in the other direction. There's no reason that this war, like many wars in Europe over the last 100 years or so, couldn't last for several more years. This could be, we could just be at the start of a very long, very awful story. And it was the week where we saw Elon Musk, the same Elon Musk who put his Starlink internet connection system at the disposal of the Ukrainians at the start of the war, uh, decide to tweet a poll about the best way to end the conflict now to avoid uh, further uh, bloodshed. There you see the, the suggestions, including uh, 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 Crimea, formerly part of Russia. Of course, it, it went down like a lead balloon, Borzu Dargahi. Yeah, I, I mean, we've talked about Ilan before, and we've talked about how he's sort of symptomatic uh, I'll say symptomatic instead of emblematic of this kind of era where billionaires seem to think that they can opine on anything. What does he know about Eastern Europe? What does he know about uh, 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 geopolitics? He's a, uh, you know, relatively successful tech guy. Uh, uh, has he ever even been to uh, Ukraine? Does he even have his, has he spoken to Ukrainian people? Uh, so I, I don't understand why he gets uh, such a platform, and it's, uh, I think it's part of a sickness of our time that he is even listened to at all. We heard the French president in an interview with a Czech newspaper uh, saying that uh, due to the size and geography of Russia, this war cannot have a purely military outcome. It must end at the negotiating table. However, Emmanuel Macron adds uh, that the time is not now. We're in the middle of the war. No one can dictate to the Ukrainians under which conditions the discussions over peace talks should start. Uh, your, your thoughts on those words by the French president? The French president has always represented that kind of practical, pragmatic wing of, uh, uh, of European diplomacy vis-a-vis -vis the Russians uh, in, in contravenience to, let's say, the Balts. Uh, Spain, oddly enough, is very good on on uh, Russia, Ukraine, uh, the Poles, obviously, and uh, other neighbors of, uh, uh, of Russia. The closer you are to Russia, the more you're concerned about it. Uh, you know, it's, it's obvious that Macron has always been negotiating, and he sees himself as the adult in the room, and sees, sees himself as a rational voice of negotiations. And obviously, someone has to do these un unpleasant phone calls with Putin. I wouldn't want to be the one to call him every single day. Someone has to, maybe, maybe. Maybe not. Did we have someone call Hitler every day in '43? I don't know. But it's obvious that for him, this this is something that's going to be concluded at the negotiation table. Uh, although it's good that he's not pushing the Ukrainians to enter premature negotiations right. when they're still making territorial gains. And what could a nuclear-armed Kremlin do when cornered for now? Well, it's signing annexation laws. Uh, we saw Vladimir Putin do that this week, the follow-up to that big party on Red Square last week, uh, annexation laws that include uh, taking control of Europe's largest uh, nuclear power plant. Uh, we heard that remark, uh, Nico Hines, uh, by the U.S. president, uh, warning about the risk of Armageddon. 
uh, Joe Biden's words, the White House qualifying them, saying that uh, uh, there's no specific intelligence at this time uh, that points to a specific uh, threat. Uh, is that Biden going rogue, or is that part of a communication strategy? I think it's always safe to assume that it's Biden going rogue um, and that the White House has to kind of try and clean up a little bit after what he said. But the truth is he's expressing a fear that I think is probably common amongst well, amongst the living rooms across Europe, but also amongst the palaces, the um, uh, heads of governments all over the world. Like, this is the closest we've been to a nuclear confrontation since the Cuban Missile Crisis. I don't think there's too much um, uh, dispute of that. And so if we're not alarmed now, I don't really know when we would be alarmed. There's still, you know, the balance of probability still suggests that things won't escalate to that stage. But I think it would be a very brave, in fact, a foolish man to discount that possibility when we just really don't know what Putin is thinking. All right. And while the West weighs Putin's nuclear-sized nuclear uh, threats, well, air raid sirens going off much further to the east. Dateline northern Japan after a North Korean missile flew over the island and into uh, the Pacific Ocean, a ballistic uh, uh, missile, we should say, capable of carrying nukes, a first since uh, 2017. And of course, drills beget counter drills, naval exercises, missile launches by the US, Japan, and South Korea, whose defense ministry put out this video. Uh, didn't always go to plan, though, with an explosion and subsequent fire, uh, which uh, Yen Ali, we understand, caused a, a measure of confusion, even panic in the coastal city of Guangdong. Uh, yeah, absolutely, especially on social media because it happened quite late in the evening. A lot of people were posting uh, pictures and videos of that fire, wondering what had happened because there was no information given uh, by the authorities till several hours later when they finally admitted that it was a missile that they had attempted to launch, but it had uh, unfortunately failed, causing a fire. Um, so, yeah, that was a bit of a scandal here. And, and more broadly, uh What's the mood where you are in Seoul after that test by the North Koreans? Well, if I'm honest with you, um, a lot of people here don't really care. They, I mean, Seoul is a bustling city. People are so busy going about their daily lives, the daily hustle. Um, and we've been living in this situation where there's these hot and cold moments with North Korea on and off uh, for at least three decades, if not seven decades, if you count, since the end of the Korean War. Um, however, if I were in Japan, in a resident of one of those two regions that had to wake up to those sirens, I'm sure they were absolutely um, far more worried. Um, it must be said, though, that if North Korea does conduct their seventh nuclear test, now that would be something that would um, alarm people here, that would interest them, they would perhaps uh, read the news a bit more and be, be a bit more worried about what's going to happen because that nuclear test is on the horizon, according to many analysts. And we saw one Pyongyang watcher earlier this week, uh, Borzo Dargai, say that um, the North Korea probably senses here a window of opportunity. It's before the Chinese Communist Party's Congress. It's while we're all focused on what's going on in Ukraine. But ultimately, does any of that matter? I mean, it, it's a mystery what the thinking is within the North Korean leadership, what their calculations are uh, in general. And I am not a North Korea expert. Uh, the, these sorts of antics by the North Koreans are meant to signal, hey, we're here. We're still here and we're still a threat and you have to deal with us. Uh, and they se seem to come about at times when um, the country is facing or fears that it is facing some sort of crisis. Um, and, you know, they're generally signaling exercises, uh, demanding the attention of the world, demanding some sort of concessions uh, and so on. I, 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 but, you know, you, you never know with this very, very closed hermetic uh, kind of country, what is the actual uh, goal? Y Yen Ali, does it feel like attention-seeking behavior? 
Absolutely, I feel like they're forcing a conversation on uh, towards South Korea, the United States, Japan. Uh, I'd like to add the, an interesting point that I've noticed in recent years in South Korea. I feel like Seoul um, no longer wants to be stuck in that back seat, strapped in, if you will. Um, it's been showing a lot of um, different um, ways of going about these these crises that we just saw last week during Armed Forces Day. Um, the president showing off, parading a lot of military hardware. I think South Korea no longer shies away about um, that desire to uh, develop those kinds of um, weapons and armament themselves. There was a poll, really interesting one, quite recently in September, I think, that showed that 70 percent of South Koreans were for the idea of developing their own nuclear uh, capabilities. So all of this, I think, illustrates that somewhat, to some extent, in the region, the power balance could change in the years to come because South Korea is willing to take a more active role. Willing to take a more active role, and uh, it, it, there's this militarization of the planet, uh, the idea that uh, everyone's uh, trying to strike out on their own. And uh, Vladimir Putin, uh, meanwhile, who's uh, doubling down, as we have kind of say every week, Vladimir Putin, who did get one early birthday present that I'm sure he'll like, the oil producers of OPEC+, Plus, that's an enlarged grouping that includes Russia, announcing a uh, cut of production of 2 million barrels of crude a day. Not a great look for the U.S. president, who spent political capital back in July by flying to Saudi Arabia to court uh, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. What's your reaction to the OPEC plus decision, Mr. President? Disappointment, and uh, we're looking at what alternatives we may have. Is there's a lot of alternatives we haven't made up our mind yet. But it is a disappointment, and it says that there are problems. Are you worried about uh, Nico Hines, uh, how much of a problem is this for Joe Biden? I think the main problem, and this is significant when we look at all these different crises, is it, it shows the weakness of the U.S. on the global stage. I think it's no coincidence that people in Seoul are craving their own uh, nuclear weapons to scare off uh, North Korea, because especially in the experience of, of the Trump presidency, there's absolutely no reason for South Korea to trust the Americans to do um, what they would like them to do. And I think Biden has done a pretty good job of steadying the ship. Uh, you know, he, he makes gas and he says things sometimes, but ultimately he's a pretty safe pair of hands. He's done a pretty reasonable job. But there's no guarantee that Trump won't be back in power or Ron DeSantis or somebody else who may not share the kind of uh, NATO focused global order um, a kind of system of thought that has governed kind of post uh, Second World War international order. So I'm not surprised that individual countries are, are trying to fight for their own corner. And it's not really a surprise that Saudi Arabia have said, Sling your hook, we'll do what we want. Do what we want. Uh, your, your thoughts on that, Vladislav Davidson? I, I do think it's a bit ungrateful uh, from the standpoint, I mean, I'm an American citizen, from the standpoint of the amount of uh, political capital that uh, the previous administration, this administration has extended to getting the, the, Saudi, the Saudis on board. It's, it's just, uh, yeah, it, it doesn't look great from the standpoint of camaraderie relations, they, they must know that uh, there are elections coming up very, very soon in America, and it looks like the kind of thing you would do to punish a wayward uh, friend or, or an ex-friend. I don't. And I, when you hear the news, yeah. for instance, that the Saudis have been awarded the Asian Winter Games, they have a facility in the desert that they haven't yet built, Yeah. Uh, does that also send the message that, uh, you know, you could it doesn't really matter what, what what your carbon footprint is and that sort of thing. We are in a moment where might seems to make right, and I, I would like that to not be the case, which is why it's very important that liberal democracies win these arguments and these wars, and if we don't, this will be the, uh, the new normal forever, or for a couple of decades until there's a new normal or a new balance of things. All right, there's pushback certainly in Iran. The slogan for women, for freedom, for life uh, has been making the rounds. It's the slogan of a movement and of a generation, it seems. Young women in the Tehran suburbs of Quds this fr Friday uh, chanting freedom, 
Three weeks into Iran's wave of protests, fewer mass demonstrations than at the outset, more acts of defiance, particularly among high schoolers. That, that video has become uh, iconic. T tell us about that video. Of I mean, it's a uh, school uh, director or education ministry official trying to address uh, uh, the students, and the students at the high school are saying, Basi G, get lost. The Basi they're calling G him being a, the, these, these pro-government these paramilitary. Yeah, they're basically insulting him. They're saying, we don't see any difference between you who fashion yourself a minister and the, you know, thugs on the street who beat us with batons. Just get lost. We don't want to hear you. Uh, in a rather uncivil display, but they are high school students. Is this normal for Iran? No, this is absolutely a rupture. It is a uh, explosion of pent up youthful energy. It is a, um, a, a an extraordinary political moment in which men are supporting women and Persians are supporting Kurds, uh, supporting Baluchi, supporting Azeris in, in terms of the ethnic divides. Uh, it is a, uh, a, a movement where you have labor uh, unions joining in and labor leaders, you have civil society people, you have rich people, poor people bringing their grievances all under this banner manner of women's rights. There's conservative people, there's more liberal, cosmopolitan people, all of them involved. Uh, the protests start at schools because that's the only place in Iran right now where people trust each other. You can create a group. You, if you meet, if you're 12 people and you meet on Facebook uh, uh, to discuss cooking, the regime is interested. Who are you? Etc. So that's how uh, totalitarian the government has become. So schools are the nucleus of this movement because it's just you, you, you know who your classmates are. And then they start with the kids and then the adults join in. And despite the clampdowns, the videos are getting out. Uh, the videos are getting out. The clampdowns are interesting. I was talking to a uh, uh, someone I know in Tehran who is living in a kind of poor conservative part of town. He lives there because of the cheap rent. He said Internet never got blocked here because there's mostly regime supporters living here. Whereas in other parts of town, uh, internet is not working. So if you just drive around, you know, they're trying to target, they know that the country is uh, tech savvy and somewhat dependent on like online banking and stuff. If you shut down the internet totally, you shut down the country, you shut down the economy. So they're trying to be selective with the internet shutdowns. Uh, it's uh, been uh, first Marsa Mimi, uh, then uh, this week this 16-year-old, uh, uh, Nika uh, Shaka Rami, um, who died in, in, in custody as well. Uh, how much attention has there been where you are, Yena Lee? Well, it must be said, not a lot. I mean, it's the kind of international news that does get relayed um, in the main news. But uh, I noticed that a smaller a feminist organization, a large feminist organization, sorry, organized a protest that ended up being quite small. Uh, several dozens of people showed up outside the Iranian embassy here in Seoul um, in support of the movement. Uh, that said, I did notice that after um, some French actresses uh, cut their hair on social media, at first First, I thought it was a bit, a bit silly or a bit frivolous. But actually, you know what? Um, cultural icons do have an impact because I've seen it on Korean social media now and, and Korean um, news outlets posting this. And it's quite interesting to see how it's gaining more attention thanks to those stars. Yeah, the stars and, uh, yeah, the cutting of hair here in the West seems to be a thing. Uh, we saw it, for instance, Wednesday at the rostrum of the European Parliament in Strasbourg with the peoples and the citizens of the EU, demand the unconditional and immediate stop of all the violence against the women and men in Iran. Until the women of Iran are free, we are going to stand with you. Jian, Jian, Azadi, women, life, freedom. That's uh, Iraqi-born Swedish uh, MEP Abir al-Salani, uh, who, who cut her hair in front of, uh, of applauding uh, lawmakers. We've seen Nico Hines, that that's been uh, repeated elsewhere. You know, Nico, it's interesting, because Thursday, uh, in this very studio, we had one uh, uh, Iranian artist saying to us that 
asking Western women to stop cutting their hair because it, for her it seemed a little gimmicky, frankly. Uh, but as you just heard Yenna Lee say, it is raising awareness. Yeah, it's interesting the you know the ways that you raise awareness usually are cheap publicity stunts, but it doesn't necessarily mean that that's going to have a big impact. But frankly, I don't think Tehran cares too much what Strasbourg is saying. Um, you know, this sort of cultural movement is hugely fascinating for the rest of the world to watch, but I think what's actually important is that it's a domestic movement. We, ha we should put our faith and our respect in the protesters um, pushing their, um, their way of, you know, having a sort of cultural revolution, even if it's a kind of minor step-by-step -step one. Um, and what you know, what the regime want to do and what they have been doing is claiming that this is all some Israeli or American plot. The truth is it's a grassroots movement and I think it's almost better if the rest of the world sits back and gives them the space. There are certain things that we maybe could do to support. Perhaps there's um, ways of making sure that um, I don't know if there's anything we can do to try and keep communication lines open, if we can do anything to boost internet or to, you know, there might be some practical things to do, but I think it's really important that we in the West um, and in Europe and even in Asia, um, you know, sit this one out and say, hey, it, it's great what you're doing and, and, and uh, let them lead the way. Uh, Borza Dargahi, I'll tell you what, was, what the talking point is in the newsroom here. It's that you saw in that clip the film star Juliette Binoche take a big chunk, whereas Marion Cotillard only took a little snippet of hair. But I mean, again, it's the question of it's got us talking about I, Iran. I just, don't, I just it's we're talking about Iran. I just don't think that the regime cares. The regime doesn't care about your protests in Toronto or New York. The regime doesn't care about what. Uh, you know, uh, Bono or Juliette Pinoche have to say about it. They don't care. They just simply don't care. And it's to them further proof of a Western conspiracy against the regime. A media war, as one uh, uh, advisor to the government keeps calling it on Twitter. Okay, uh, look, well, then let me ask you this. The, the arrest uh, in Tehran of these, uh, or these, what seem to be forced confessions of these two French. Arrested in May. And, and, and now, somehow they're responsible for protests in September? No, it's a joke. That's right. But why are they, why is a videotape of these two French nationals confessing to being French spies? appearing suddenly now. Because they're trying to create this fiction that this is a foreign movement, that this is some kind of foreign operation. This so this is, is for domestic consumption. It's absolutely. Yeah, it's absolutely for. They've had these guys since May, and they trot them out. And, uh, you know, I mean, that's basically they're looking for characters in their movie. They're doing all sorts of grotesque things. I think the one thing that would help, for example, the Iranians in the country that I talk to, they say, where's our government in exile? Why don't the Iranian opposition groups who are abroad stop protesting and create a government in exile? Stop the protests. Stop, you know, appearing naked and, and uh, at protests in the Netherlands and giving the regime ammunition and instead organize an inclusive, responsible uh, 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 government abroad that looks like Iran and that can go around and say that, look, we can take power if the regime falls. Why don't they organize, this is my suggestion, organize funds for striking workers? or uh, 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 lawyers for people who are political prisoners, help pay for those lawyers who are volunteering their time right now trying to get people out of jail, instead of these performative acts. Vladislav Davidson? I, I have, I'm uh, probably not as unwelcome as this gentleman across mm -hmm. the, uh, the uh, but I have not been able to uh, spend much time anymore in uh, in Iran in uh, in a decade. I, I used to go a lot and I spent a lot of time there, but I I, I can't really go and have on the ground uh, conversations with people now. Obviously, the regime has lost its legitimacy. It's obvious that this is in one way or another the beginning of the end. Is the end going to come uh, this week or this month or even this year? Who knows? Uh, I don't think it's 1905. I think it's 19, 1916 for for the regime. I, I would. I would References put, to Russia there. Uh, of course, I, well, it's how I think. That's where, <laughs> that's where I'm from. Sorry. I, this is, uh, uh, you know, part, by the way, parts of parts of uh, northern Iran were in fact occupied by the, the Soviet Union in the, in the early 20s. People forget this. It's very interesting. The history of the Soviet uh, incursion into into northern Iran. But the uh, again, not to get off track. The I, I do believe that the, the this regime has lost its political legitimacy. There's no going back. And sooner rather than later, by by sooner I mean within a couple of years, uh, we're going to see something else.
I mean, it doesn't pay to be in the prediction business, but... Yeah, I mean, I just, the, the regime is so strong. They have so many different tools of repression. They have yet to call upon the Revolutionary Guard. They've yet to call upon the army. They're still using uniform police. They're still using the, the informal Basiji militias. Uh, I think they still have a lot of firepower there. Uh, the protesters are motivated. Is that enough? Uh, is this uh, but just one last question on this. Sure. Is it shooting at women different from shooting at men in Iran in this case? Yeah, it's, it, it, it captures people's anger much more, especially not just women. They're shooting like 16-year-old kids and, and throwing them. Who knows what they're doing to them, but they're showing up dead, and then they're lying about it and trying to make up stories and forcing people, relatives, to give these grotesque you know, statements saying, oh, yeah, my, my daughter had uh, mental health problems. And then it turns out it's not even her, 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 her mother who's saying this, but like a distant relative who's been blackmailed into talking. Just like gruesome stuff that mm. is going on right now. So yeah, it's, it offends people. Uh, it creates anger. It's just that the regime is so strong and they have so much repressive power and they have, you know, uh, uh, all sorts of uh, uh, electronic tools and surveillance tools that they have not even fully deployed yet. Speaking of women who face long odds, Liz Truss's week ended better than it started after a humiliating climb down on tax cuts for the rich, the UK prime minister, uh, mending fences with France, Dateline Prague, where there was a, a summit of uh, European countries uh, and its friends. Uh, she uh, sat down with Emmanuel Macron. Remember when she was running for Conservative Party leader this summer, she said the jury was still out over whether the French president was friend or foe. Macron was happy that the jury has now ruled in his favor. Because this is an island, this is true, but this island didn't move from the rest of the continent. So we do have so many things in common, and we have values, and we have history and so on. So we will, I'm happy that we meet again. Nico Heinz, we have so many things in common. Look, at the end of the day, this is another U-turn for Liz Truss. She wanted to try and look tough and stand up against Macron and these pesky Europeans, but ultimately, she needs every friend she can get at the moment. Uh, so I think she has actually done the right thing. She's put some of her um, uh, bellicosity to one side in order to try and uh, build bridges to Europe, which I think is really important. And Macron's new European club could turn out to be a very useful talking shop, which uh, you know, it's, it's a great time to suddenly have Ukraine and Georgia and Azerbaijan and Britain and the EU all in a room discussing uh, the kind of crazy issues that are happening in Europe at the moment. So I think that is that is positive. Liz Truss, on the other hand, there's really nothing positive to say. The, the last two weeks has just been the most unbelievable collapse that we've ever seen, in certainly in the last 100 years of British politics. The popularity ratings are now down to 14%. She's something like minus 59 net favourability, which is worse than Boris Johnson or Jeremy Corbyn managed. And it took years to get people to hate them that much. Um, so, you know, we've just talked about the potential dying days of a hardline regime in Iran. That may be a long way off. This this regime is on the brink of collapse right now. Yeah, while tr Truss was in Prague, Britain was being warned <laughs> of rolling power outages this coming winter. For its front page uh, this Friday, the Daily Mirror dug up a picture of a candlelit Newcastle pub in 1970 with the caption, Return to the Dark Ages. Uh, though truth be said, uh, Nico Hines, uh, sh there's no election coming up. You've just had a leadership change. Aren't, aren't you uh, going to keep your prime minister for the time being? Well, I think there's a very good question that was rolling around Conservative Party conference in Birmingham last week, which was, what's more absurd, keeping Liz Truss or having another leadership campaign? You know, the truth is there is no good outcome for the Tories at the moment. She's completely shot her entire legitimacy. Um, she's being criticised by all wings of the Conservative Party. We're not talking about criticised by outside parties here. With She is under fire from every wing of her own party. Some people who believe that she's already 
U-turned and thrown away the reason that she was elected in the first place by getting rid of these radical tax cuts that she wanted to bring in. There are other more moderate members of the Conservative Party who think that her crazy, uh, well, what they portray, what they perceive to be crazy radical economic ideas, which seem to have crashed the pound and caused this run on gilts, which the Bank of England had to step in to save and has now forced up our interest rates in this country. Whichever part of the Conservative Party you're in, there seems to be people gunning for her. Obviously, you've got the Labour Party and all the other parties gunning for her as well. And we've now got a 33-point lead for the Labour Party in the polls. It doesn't look as though there's any immediate resolution to this, but I can't see any way in which the Conservative MPs, whose jobs, remember, will be on the line when an election does come, keeping someone in place who's guaranteed to cost them their jobs. Yenna Lee, do you agree? And did you see this coming? I don't have much more to add than Nick. It's been absolute shambles. Um, I mean, Liz Truss already had such such a small slither of legitimacy when she started and she's lost that small amount she had already um, from anyone observing. It really hasn't gone very smoothly at all. Um, I don't know how long it will take for the British public to forget what has happened or if she'll make more mistakes to come or if that was the biggest she'll ever make. But, you know, what happened was might be pretty unforgettable for some voters. We'll have to see. I mean, you know, politics, it can it can go really fast, but it can also be unforgettable. What's interesting in Borza Dargahi is uh, uh, when her party was elected in 2019 in a general election, it was uh, this the, this idea that this promise by Boris Johnson that he would get Brexit done and this sort of protection. Uh, and instead, she's she's opted for uh, a, a free, complete free market approach, which she still had, by the way, at that Conservative Party conference this week in Birmingham. I, I think that if you look at Liz Truss's history, she's someone who's basically just a, you know, uh, 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 not really someone who has very hard core principles. Uh, she's basically become a professional politician, and she's just getting ideas, you know, in a way it's like Biden and Saudi Arabia, just getting stupid ideas from bad advisors who are, you know, like they're like, no, no, go to Saudi, you know, and got him there. And now you have Liz Truss getting, you know, like they go to these think tanks, really, really, really bad, weak politicians. They go to these think tanks, they read these policy papers, they listen to these losers that no one else listens to. And now you've got a situation where she's obviously desperate um, and just cycling through, okay, to this week we're against France. This week we're in favor of France, just trying to get those poll numbers up. And I, I, I see the same thing with Turkey and Erdogan, who's also facing an election and losing there, just going through these really bad ideas in, in, in very quick pace in hopes that something will gel and save their uh, political career ahead of, of elections that are coming up in the UK. So far, though, Erdogan's had longer staying power than Liz Truss. It's true. <laughs> That's absolutely true. Yeah, he's been in power for a very long time. Yes. No, but the, 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 uh, your thoughts on this, the, the, the way Nico Hines described it, that infighting within the conservatives. I mean, she, she was a kind of con a consensus candidate, and uh, she was a, a candidate of uh, trying to, to get the, the conservatives space to, to limp to the next election. One of the main concerns uh, with, uh, with, with uh, the choice was who would be the best leader for the next election. And she was, she was settled on as a kind of consensus candidate by, by some fractions within the, within the Tories. And obviously, it, it turns out that that maybe not, may not have been the best choice. I'm not myself a Tory or British, so it's, it's, uh, it doesn't matter to me. As a Ukrainian, she's good for us. I'm, I'm happy that she's continuing Boris Johnson's policy. But, uh, you know, it's, you know. It, it has reaped benefits, uh, Nico Hines, with uh, the, uh, Britain being uh, uh, invited into this uh, rapid response military uh, uh, f um, uh, setup that's uh, at that summit. Uh, also, perhaps being brought in the loop when it comes to energy purchases with some countries, or at least energy programs. Uh, it, again, she can rebound a little. 
Well, I think I don't know about consensus candidate within the Conservatives, but there's a strong consensus now, which is that she's utterly useless and she has to go. I think when you talk about how long is going to take for the mini budget that was announced and has now been recanted? Um, if it, to, talking about how long voters will remember that, I suspect strongly that voters are going to remember that for a decade, and that the Conservatives are probably going to be out of power for a 10-year spell. You know, much like Labour have been for the last 10 years here, and um, the Conservatives were again for 10 years before that. You know, Britain does tend to have these kind of slow cycles, and I think Liz Truss has done such huge damage to the Conservative Party that British voters will not forgive and forget that. At the end of the day, she crashed the economy for everybody in order to give a tax cut to people who are earning over £150,000 a year. And there's just very few people in Britain who think that's a good idea. And that will be our, our final word. It goes to you, Nico Hines. Thank you so much for being with us uh, from London. I want to thank Yenna Lee for burning the midnight oil or the 2.45 a.m. oil in uh, Seoul, South Korea. Uh, Borzu Daragahi, uh, Vladislav Davidson, thank you for being with us here in The World This Week.